No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today I'm very, very honored to be in the presence of one of the more legendary uh, executives, uh, a and behind the scene type characters throughout my time observing hip hop. Very, very excited to have Shine Money XL in the building. Oh, thanks for having me here. Pleasure, man. Super excited, man. Yep, um, in the building. I actually had uh, Orlando Wardenberg say something the other day. He's like, you know, me and Wayno, I think we're the only A&Rs you ever interviewed. And I don't know that that's true, but we need to expand the list either way. <laughs> it's time now, right? I mean, it's some of the most interesting they getting, they conversations. They're getting busy, though. They're getting busy, so yeah. respect to them for that. When did you start thinking of yourself as an a r or do you still fuck with that description? Or how do you think of what you're doing in the game? 2002, I started realizing that I was more than just a producer. Mm. That's when I realized I ain't know the title yet, you know, but I started putting together plays and music and records and things that wasn't my beat. Like, this wasn't my beat, but I'm running to the artist and saying, you need to rap to this. Mm. Finding the right hook. Yo, this is a dope hook. You should put that, put this single on that or whatever. Mm. So I just started doing that naturally, and it just turned into a and because after you see the, the actual results, it's like, yo, I did that, I did that, I picked this beat, I brought this producer to the session, and then all of a sudden, get rich or die trying. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, that must have been, like when we think about that project, I mean, that's that's a very, very high pressure scenario for you to be attempting to have any kind of creative input. So it's like the stakes are really fucking high with that sort of project. Yeah, I mean, but we created the whole, the stakes and the pressure and the whole thing because we came together knowing that this is the, this is someone that they wanted to kill, of course. Mm. So he's blessed to be in this position where he's back in the studio rapping. Right. But with all the, the odds against him and all the energy that's that's present, the people calling, trying to find him and finish the job, that kind of energy led you to know that, Joe, you can't be running outside just recklessly. Mm. So we in my basement, we recording every day and we get into it and we not thinking about outside. We just in the studio working. Mm. So that's how we got into that zone where everything got created. Well, you know, it's interesting. People always say, like, you don't really know that these are the, the best times of your life or, like, the most epic moments of your life until much later. Facts. That's when you kind of start to realize, like, That's fuck, right. I was in the middle of the shit right then. Real talk. Did you know at that time? Did you know well, how important it was? I knew something was different because everybody was calling my phone and even the homies was like, yo, you need to stay away from him, man, because this <laughs> motherfucker, you know, shit is crazy. So I interview people all the time when I get that from people. Yeah, yeah like stay away, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's like... You can interview them, but don't go to the hood with them. So I knew the odds was increased because everybody was against it. Mm -hmm. So, But I'm going to sit it like, yo, whatever you're willing to die for, live for, you got to be ready to die for. So this is one of those opportunities where the risk, no risk, no reward. So here I am, young, hungry, Knowing music, knowing that I could see the future early, mm. and I took that chance. I remember there was a, a Jay Z quote where he said that he had told everybody on the rock that somebody was going to come in the game around that time, around like 2002, and somebody was going to DMX the game. And then it ended up being 50, but he, he had known that like the game was ready at that time for somebody to come in with just pure macho energy, That's just right. pure street energy. And he was preparing the whole squad because he had a whole squad from Philly all the mm -hmm. way down to Memphis Bleak. And he was letting them know, like, somebody's about to come, man. And a lot of amazing artists. But at the end of the day, like, the, the 50 wave was was bigger than the music. It was bigger. It was the personality, the music, the, the group, the branding, everything. Yeah, it turned into a movie. We right. lived a life that turned into a movie. But so were you around in his career prior to him putting out the freestyle about robbing everybody? Or when did you when did you insert yourself into yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. I, was, I, was, uh, I met him through Jam Master J, rest in peace. Right. And uh, that was in the early, like, 95, 96 Holy shit. And so as soon as he signed in Jay, that's how I met him, because I was in the studio interning for JMJ, and he played uh, the hit, a record that they did together. Uh -huh. And I was I was fascinated with that song, like, yo, this dude is dope. I want to work with him. So he's like, you do? So he went and got him and brought him to the studio, and that's how I met him. Holy shit, though. That, that, that's pretty amazing that it could be, like, you were working with him for six plus years before he really started yeah, to take off? since he started. Like, yeah, as soon as he got with Jay, that's when I got with him. And at the same time, we came up on the J. That's pretty incredible because I remember there being like a very significant lull between him coming out robbing everybody. And it kind of seemed, you know, that's like a certain lane is that like we've seen a lot of rappers come out and do sort of like troll type songs like that, get a bunch of attention. But mm -hmm. 
you very rarely expect that to turn into an actual career. And there was like a nice big gap before it happened. Yeah, no, nah, it was because he was studying hip hop. Mm. I would watch him studying Beanie, studying different artists and what they doing, how they coming with it. Then Beanie had this record where he was just rapping straight through and he was just going crazy. Mm. So you could see the talent. So it was like he was figuring it out. So he came with that How to Rob. That was soon as he kind of left Jay and started with Trackmasters. Mm. And he would, that was when he was in the studio with them and came up with that song right there on the spot and did that. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, but, but what kept you engaged for that long? Because to stay on top of an artist who isn't successful for six years, I always think about that because like my, la my line here is like, we get in, we do the content, it takes like an hour or two, and then that's it. That's we get, it. We gotta just put it out. The challenge of building an artist up and being able to weather like years and years of them not being profitable, successful, it's like mm -hmm. that has to take a huge amount of confidence and belief in yourself as well as the artist. Yeah, and you gotta remember in the 90s, there was no internet, so mm -hmm. time didn't move that fast. The, the slow come we up was more as normal. Good yeah. as a, yesterday's blog roll, like mm -hmm. it had more time. So with him. You got fond memories of the blog <laughs> roll. I heard you mention that on another podcast. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? So we had time. So. For me, it's all about belief, and I'm, I'm in Queens producing for everybody. Mm. Royal Flush over there, you know, everybody, Cormega, Havoc, Prodigy. So I know everything happened in every part of Queens, and I knew that he was different. He was mm. special, so it was just like a matter of time that I knew it before it would connect. Mm. So I was committed, and I was committed to everybody that was coming out of Queens at that time period. Right. So that was one of the focuses. Yeah, do you think there was something special about that era in Queens in particular? Because we don't necessarily think of Queens as being where the, the new New York heat is coming from right now. Yeah, I mean, Nas is my favorite rapper. He mm. started a wave that, I mean, for Queens, we was the best that did it for mm. the whole New York as far as sales and artists that came out of there. So I was just waiting for the next lineup, and I knew that we was in line. So I just got it ready and just put the time in. Definitely. Yeah. But when you're working on 50s career and stuff, he's like, actively beefing with Nas for a significant portion of that, right? They're not. It was people's, actually. At it, first. It was first, yeah, yeah. It was a short period. I mean, that was fifth just, you know, doing what he had to do. The, the early part of us understanding that he was going to become a troll, mm. which is what he, he kind of dominates with. So that was just the early stages, you know what I mean? But I think him and Nas is good now. But at that time, something did happen, and they had a little off time. So that, yeah. was, that was a part of that. Is it a little weird to, like, have so much of your the early days of your career and very much, like, you proving what you were worth in the industry tied up in somebody that you don't have a good relationship with now? Like, you don't what? speak about him like you're spiteful at all. No, I'm not, because it was – we. You, know, you don't you don't want to invest your time. You, you got people in your house, in your basement, your kids upstairs. If that, it was to happen, it would happen in your house first, because that's where he spent most of his time. Mm. So you don't put that type of energy and that time and investment in someone and then turn around and have to – feel like this hate and this then you're going to be mad at every step they take i don't live like that mm. I, I knew he was a superstar so i put that time in and that's what i'm about so for me now i mean even now it's not like a hate thing we don't hate each other it's not like that we just had a difference and we had to split ways mm. and you know the, the media of course emphasizes and make things different and you know time we all move in different directions i went to def jam and went to epic so he went to keep doing his thing so we just had to show each other that still we could survive without each other mm. and that's what we had now but, you, know what I mean? but you don't really talk or nothing, but it's just kind of you assume that it's sort of cooled off since it hasn't been in the media for I mean, years and years. I'm just not chasing the energy of all of that. So, mm -hmm. you know, for me, I've grown. You know what I mean? Some of the mistakes I made when I was 20, I'm different now. You know what I mean? So it's like you got to look back and like, yo, we was young. We was dumb. We was just getting money. So some of the mistakes, some of the, the things that was done. We just was young. We didn't know. So that's what we have to live with. We can't just live in guilt. You know what I mean? Mm. You got to let that shit go or you won't heal from none of that. No, definitely. You know? Yeah. I mean, but along the way, he very much like made confrontation and, and issues with other people like a huge part of the brand. Was that ever taken to an extent that worried you or you thought this is not good for what we're building long term? Yo, since the day I met him, we, we had, had <laughs> yo, we literally walking in the studio shooting five. Like, right. so back in the days, they called it slap boxing. So he was always with the drama, with the energy, letting you know he was tough. He was always with the bully shit. So for me, it was like, I already knew. So it's like, all right, he's a real one. So you got it. You don't want to run from the real one. You want to get with the real one. So mm. I knew that he was, he wasn't the one that you could take and just play with like that. So 
that was my thing. Like, I knew that he was the truth. And mm -hmm. that's what I was investing in. I wasn't trying to get behind no whack rappers that wasn't really doing nothing. That wasn't really what they saying on the records. And I wasn't with it. So I knew that he was the truth. And that's what I was about, all about. But that's a big decision to make as a and or anyone working with an artist is that at a certain point, sometimes the rapper that you believe in the most might be a person that you would never tolerate in your life. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The but last I mean, person you would want around you if it wasn't for the fact they were mega talented. Yeah, and you can see by, you know, as he has his fallouts, eventually it'll come your way. It's just like that, you know, that, that, mm. that hand you're just waiting to point your way. So, you know, I knew eventually we was going to fall out because we was, we was having early fallouts at the beginning, like certain things we would argue about that he would see differently because he was raised by a pimp, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. he got the pimp mentality and he looked at certain even dudes as hoes like, yo, keep them broke so I could keep them with me. So certain kind of mentality that he was taught wasn't based on business of corporate 500s that we eventually ended up doing business with, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he had to adjust in that mindset too. That kind of strategic thinking. I mean, I know that you, you probably are like me where there's definitely people in your life that you're like, I should have known not to fuck with him because I saw the way he treated other people <laughs> and I should have known that eventually it would come back yeah, to it, me. That's a pattern. Mm -hmm. you know, unless you get out of that, it takes kind of therapy, certain things that you got to do for mind education just to feed the brain to get out of those patterns or you just live with it for the rest of your life and that's who you are and mm -hmm. if you're good with it that's cool but for me i'm always challenging myself challenging myself to be better so i couldn't get with that how do you have a separation between what you're doing in terms of the artists you're working with like even when i was listening to you talk about being in the studio when bobby got popped and shit and like you were like you know yeah i could i could be sitting on the couch at home with my family that night but I got to be with the guys. I got to I got to be involved. And mm -hmm. it very much like if you're going to be in this business, the more hands on you can be, the more essential you make yourself, the more important it is. Mm -hmm. But how do you how has that balance changed as you became an adult and have other concerns? It's, it when, changed, when, it when you're young, it's just yeah. pure grind. Yeah, because you got to get to it. Mm -hmm. And this is the time you got to put an endless hours and you thousand have, you, hours. when you have nothing. You got no it's risk, no risk, no reward. That's mm -hmm. the real term that we live by. So I'm in the in the fire. Like we got to deal with it. Whether it's getting to shows where you don't know if this promoter's real, or this is some janky shit, or something could happen, or whether you in the studio dealing with a bunch of kids that got a lot of shit going on that you don't even know. Mm -hmm. I've never been in the hip hop part of social work, like like a social worker or some kind of thing. Like you ask artists what they prize is or what they dealing with. In hip hop, the better, the better, man. So it's like you got to get with the real ones, and that's all I've been about. So for me, it's never been a fear, a fear thing or something I worried about. It's just shit happens. You just got to be prepared for when it happens. Mm. And I've been prepared, man. You've been prepared, but you know, there's got to be an extent to which, like, you you have to find that balance, and you have to like find a way for you to be doing what's best for yourself and your own mental health while also being around dudes who are like 20 they have seemingly endless energy they sleep all fucking day while you're in the office yeah and that can be like really really hard to to balance that now in the in the beginning first 10 years probably i didn't have that balance it was mm -hmm. all about work and i didn't get enough time with my first two children certain things that i didn't do that i learned eventually to now with my new you know my my next children to spend that time and have that so that's just being an adult you're a young man turning into a real man but you you think you a man you're not so mm. i had to get to that frequency which i eventually got to and that's when the time was balanced not everything is about money not everything's about music it's all about the balance mm, definitely you know um yeah was there was there ever a time like in comparison to like your involvement with bobby's career versus your involvement with 50s career i'm assuming that with 50 it was much more hands-on because that's like the only real artist that you're concerned about at that moment now mm -hmm. you got a whole bunch of artists that you you have to spread your time between like mm -hmm. what was your lifestyle like back then versus versus now and like like how do you make sense of that i make sense of this there's a line that i learned a quote there's victims and volunteers in life right mm. and um i would like to say that 50 at that moment in his life was a victim mm. and with that you don't know what's going to happen next because it was literally someone attempting to kill him, right? Mm. So you always have to be on point. So now here's his his squad and the team. Shout out to everybody in Southside and in Shadyville that was behind us holding us down. And they was holding shit down, guns and all, like ready security without being security, you know? Mm. So you got to be able to have that and, you know, have those type of troops around you to hold you down. And we had to live that ever, right? Right. The difference between that, he was more in a defensive mode. So now he's looking at everything coming. With Bobby, they was the ones running around wilding out. They mm. were volunteers. They was with this shit. So they were doing shit that ended up getting caught up to them 
which came back and pulled them down at the time it was time for them to go up. Mm. So that was the, the, you know, that was the past catching up with them. So that's the difference how I look at it. There was a victim and there was a volunteer. So it's two different stories. 50 didn't go to jail. Mm. You know what I'm saying? He was able to get out of that situation and make it to the top. And when you really look at the history... That's a good formula of success. Mm. When, when you look at the history of New York City rappers over the past like 20 years or whatever, 50 is kind of the rare exception that blew up and didn't immediately have his career implode. Mm-hmm. Because we've just seen it happen so nah. many times, whether it's a Fed case, whether it's fucking... Just Two record capped, deals, all kinds anything. of... Anything, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. To what do you credit that? The fact that he had just been through so much. He was an older guy by the time you signed him to, yeah. in, in the grand he, scheme He of was things. like 26 right. when that shit happened. So when Get had, Rich came out, 26. He, he had seen a lot of misery and failure. Yeah, nah. He's seen sign a deal, mm. think it's going to happen, don't happen. Sign another deal. You on you on the hospital bed and they releasing you like, hey, you can have your pub back. Wow. <laughs> they gave him back everything. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Thinking he was about to die and like, yeah, here's your shit back. So he's seen the whole world turn against him. Mm. You know what I mean? So for him, he view it differently. And that's where the cold heart come from because he was, you know what I mean? So, but at that point, it was a blessing. Here I come and we get to the next level. So I consider myself a blessing. Mm, definitely. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah you know. You, as a person like that who's just full of so much talent, it's it's very much necessary that like you find a team around you that will actually help nurture that. And I mean, you could very, very easily imagine 50's career not having turned into what it was because we've seen so many talented rappers not turn into what they could have been. That's right. I mean, you with Trackmasters, they got a label, Steve Styles a part of it. There's so many big execs. You think the formula is going to work. Mm. But then you get with another broke nigga from Queens and you in his basement and then that formula works. Right. So it's all about formula for success. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? You, you can't make the same recipe two different ways and expect it to come out the same way. You need that formula to stay the same. It's a recipe. Definitely. You know? So let's, let's pull it all the way back. We just kind of hit a bunch of the 50 stuff yeah. early on. But talk about like your early days and how you realized that you were meant to be uh, in this music business. Yeah, I woke up. First, I started as a piano kid. Like, my mom's put me in piano school, so I learned And you music. liked it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My parents tried that with me. It didn't work. It didn't work? No, I didn't give a fuck. Yeah, yeah. nah. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. When I look back at it now, I'm like, that could have been the start of something yeah, really important for you right in your there. life. That exactly. would have been the rock band or something, man. <laughs> or I could have made a Pooh Shiesty beat or something, and you could have been dancing right? around on them keys, it's you know? For real. So, for me, it just kind of translated to me understanding music immediately faster. Mm. And then as I'm hearing hip-hop, I'm like, yo, that's a piano that they playing and that's drums and I'm figuring it out. Mm. So I just immediately want to get to some DJing, like let me get some records and start playing records. And that immediately turned into me wanting to make the actual records that I'm playing, like let me make a beat. Mm. So it was a it was a real quick progression from playing piano to DJ to producer. Mm. I had a short st- a period where I tried to be a rapper. Right. I was like the first mumble rapper you ever heard. <laughs> That was and how you define horrible. your yeah, style? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was terrible. So I knew it wasn't going to be my career. You know mm. what I'm saying? I had to choose that. My homie's like, yo, nah, stick to the beats. That's amazing that you were able to rep- recognize that, though, because I feel like I constantly am meeting people that I think would be really talented execs mm-hmm. or be able to work in the business in some way, yeah. and they're like, nah, I'm going to be a rapper. <laughs> and it's just like They want the big bag. You know yeah. what? They want the big, big bag. They want the, the, And in some ways, I think they want to fail. They mm-hmm. want to pick an idea that they know has like almost 0% chance of working out. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And then they blame everybody else mm. when it don't work. You see it over but and never, over. But never give you the credit when it do work. But that big, one of the biggest issues, if you want to make something out of your life, is sort of like being able to be real with yourself and realize what you're good at and what you're not good at. So I find that very impressive that you were able to, to give it a shot to be so clearly in love with hip hop and then not feel the need to really keep pushing the issue that wasn't meant to be. Yeah, nah, because I had speech issues as a kid, so I already oh, really? was like, like, ah, oh, I already know. But I wanted to rap because I was into it. But if you had made it, then you'd be saying I had speech issues yeah, as a kid, yeah, and I that's would've... what made me special. <laughs> <laughs> Just like 50 got shot in the tooth, and that becomes like, the story. Yeah, there, but it was like, nah, I ain't going to do that. Mm. Be the first mumble rapper. I said, let's wait for the South to do that. What, what was the music that was like, had you so excited about hip hop at that time? Like, what were the artists that stood out to you and, and made you lose your mind about this shit? Oh man, this is starting with Run DMC, mm. LL Cool J, you know, the whole era, that 80s sound that Def Jam was pushing out and Public Enemy, that Eric B and Rock Kim, cool, you know, that whole era, man, mm. everything Marley Ma was doing, just having my hands and hearing video music box, watching the videos and seeing everybody from Houdini. Dana Dane and all of them just start coming with all different. Then Slick Rick, mm. I was it. That was it. 
it just kept elevating. And it just started off real simple and just kept elevating. Does it ever irritate you or, or feel a certain way that the mass, vast majority of the artists you probably work with right now have no knowledge or appreciation of the shit that you grew up on and the problem is going to get worse the longer you stay in the game. Yeah, because, I mean, we took away a lot of the, the part of the art that I respect. Like, I'm a vinyl collector, so mm. I've been buying vinyl since I was a DJ waking up 13, learning that not just um, owning hip-hop vinyl, but getting soul and pop and rock and all different kind of bands and start collecting it. So I had a love for records, credits, who's doing what, the producers. I had a love for that. That was like a passion for me. So for me, you know, learning who was in a, a part of an era that I didn't live was a part of that passion. Mm. So I'm knowing who's in the 70s doing Motown and production and all of that. You know, David Porter, everybody that's doing shit mm. back then. So that was just how I came up for the love. They're missing that because they don't get credits. They don't got a CD. They don't have a piece of nothing to read. Spotify hardly give real credits, you know, mm. it just producer and that's it, writer. It doesn't give you the, the whole real story. Even the attitude, like when I started doing these podcasts, so much of the stuff that I was excited about or that people were excited about was like random shit bubbling up on SoundCloud and everything. And now a lot of times when you look at rap fans, it's almost like they don't feel like they have the freedom to like music that isn't popular yet because so much of the music ecosystem has to do with Spotify essentially like co-signing your content to get it onto playlists and, yeah. and get it you know respected by the the mainstream and sometimes I see that and it's kind of confusing me because I grew up always being so excited about rappers who really were not commercially successful That's at right. all I just mm -hmm. fucked with them finding them on live mixtapes or all different kind of sites or actually getting a mixtape in the streets, mm. which they took away the actual tangible part. So now it's all digital. You got to go search. But how do you, like, have, have you always felt like you were able to, f like, fluidly maintain your taste in hip-hop even when, when you listen to a Bobby Shmurda, he's not doing anything that would qualify him as a top rapper in a previous era. Yeah. But there's something about it that everybody, like, well, I mean, everyone knew when they heard it. 50 wasn't the biggest lyrical, so it's about the talent, the star that's in them mm. from the energy that they put in the music. Because Bobby came with a hit on one song. And then when we got in the studio, I seen that he had it in him. So mm. you know you can make more once you see that. And I think for me, it's about changing with times as well, because you can't look at what you did in early 2000 and now the late 2000s. So for me, I had to evolve and then find something from the South, Big Crit, mm. find Big Two Chains, you know what I'm saying? And just find other talent like Yo Gotti and work with them and then be able to elevate where they at to new levels. Because I learned from Dre and them. So there's certain things that I learned that I think I could pass on too. Right. You know what I mean? Just in the studio. It is crazy because it's like when you think about what your business is, it's like you're at the fucking roulette table and you're placing bets on all these different artists. And then it's like, how long do you want to hold on to that bet and continue to, to try to fucking make it work? Like, have there, have there been and I'm sure there's been tons of artists that you put very significant amounts of time into that didn't work out or you realize at a certain point, like I give up. It's not it's not going to happen. Yeah. Like, no, nah, I could probably count on my hand about four. That many. So you, yeah. you are super selective with the artists. Yeah, I'm yeah, very huh? selective. And I uh, promise you, two of them probably because they went to jail. Mm. You know what I mean? Life shit that I don't ask. Like, you got prize. I just, and then life catches them. Or they get into some shit while they're in it because they really in the streets and then that shit catch up to them. Right. Or there's ones that just end up just not wanting to be superstars and then just figure they wanted to do music but didn't know it takes some real work. You right. know? So I've, I've seen it from both sides. But the question for somebody like you is like, how hands on do you get? How, uh, in, in, in the music? All the way. I mean, I make music. I'm mm. a producer first. Right. That's what got me in the game. Right. So if I'm not actually giving you the beat that you're making the music to, like we started with, and half the, half the music I do, I do at least one track on every album, right? Mm. So if not that, I'm finding you the best beats. Right. So if, if I know I don't got this sound and it's like you need that extra turn up shit, I got to go down south, find somebody, I'm going to find them, and I'm, we going to bring that to the table. Right. So I get involved from the whole thing, and then if it's like you ain't making the right hook, I'm going to find that person too. Right. You know, and we're going to get that going on too. So we're making the whole song, and then we're going to mix it. I'm going to mix with the engineer right there and make the song. But when you have to go out and find beats for artists, how, how frustrating can that be when they don't necessarily respect your vision in terms of what production is worthy of them getting on? Well, I used to do a producer conference one-stop shop. So right. I used to bring over four or 500 producers all in one building. Uh -huh. So I had my pick of the litter from everyone from here to South Africa making beats, like Australia, here in the States. 
And uh, at that era, we developed some of the best producers that's now, like Jake One, Ilman, mm. you know what I mean? S One, they all came out there, Kanai Finch, and they were new guys. And now they top producers right now. So I've always been in touch with producers and the producer community. Mm. That was important to me. Well, I mean, you get in the studio with somebody like Bobby Schmurter for the first time. Do you have to be careful about how much coaching or how much you want to get involved in the beginning part because you have to build that relationship and you no. don't you don't want him on day one being like this motherfucker just told me to rewrite my verse i've never rewritten a verse before. no we're not that. doing that we're not doing that kind okay. of no no actually what i'm doing is i'm following the template he that first beat was jalil beats yo call jalil get him from philly get him back over here let him deliver another one right so i'm keeping what the foundation is already telling me mm. and even you stay with the same producers the guy that did computers have them bring some more beats. And then you, you kind of keep that energy going. Mm. You just kind of put it in order now. I feel it. The only stuff, I've always like been in the studio and I've thought about diving in there and just giving my opinion about shit. But usually the only time I'll really go for it is when they're fucking something up grammatically. <laughs> like when the sentence sucks. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not, like you are not trying to say it like that. The way you want to say it is this, but for some reason it like flipped in your head. Yeah. That's I find that like really important and really frustrating. Or when they're really trying to like overload the verse with with syllables, mm -hmm. it drives me insane. Yeah, nah, I know those type of rappers too. That's a Syllable huge problem. Serious, yeah. Trim it down. Syllable serious. Yeah. Less, Thanks. less syllables. <laughs> I mean, that was the great thing about Fifty is that like you know you mentioned it before, but he got a lot of shit for not being lyrical. At that time, we might now kind of look at him and be like, you don't really seem that different from a, a, a Jada Kiss or a Styles P in terms of as a lyricist. Mm -hmm. But at that time, he was slowing it down and spreading it out, and it was, it was That's different. Right. That's right. Putting a, southern, a little southern accent on some, some of the records mm. so you could relate. You know, He knew how to do it with the voice and everything. Were you, did you think that New York or, or hip-hop as a whole was going to have a, a learning curve in terms of how he was rapping at that time? Nah, I just knew that he was a universal one. Like, mm. I could see it. I could hear it. I've been listening to everybody, you know, seeing Biggie and Jay come before him and Nas. So I knew where this was going because he was making shit like Wayne in my basement. I'm hearing it before they hearing it. Mm. So I hear like, yo, he, yo, you sound like you from the South on this record. Like, I knew it. Wangster made sense to you right away? Immediately. You're like, this is it. Like, oh, shit. This song's huge. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. I believe it for sure. You know? So. In high school, you was the man, homie. <laughs> Do you remember that yeah. moment? What was, what was, what was, what was the energy in the room at that, that, that moment? Shit, man. We all looked at each other like, God damn, man. We got one. We all know that guy. Yeah. Yep. We all know that the coolest guy from high school is a uh, fucking loser now. Yep. <laughs> and they seeing us right now, thinking they was the man back then. Facts. You know? Um, okay, but so what would you define as the thing that made G-Unit not work? in the long run because it was going so good for the first however many projects you know like the banks project the bucks pro Buck project the game project they're all like legendary albums maybe tony Gayo didn't necessarily he wasn't meant to be this huge star but his project still did fairly well but then like around then it felt like things started to just crumble a bit what would you identify as the major cracks in the foundation that made that inevitable i think um the way i put it is uh you could have a uh, a lot of a little mm. or a little of a lot. And I think 50 thing, he wanted it all. Mm. So he chose everything, right? But those little pieces that you give out, me, Banks, everybody else that's eating, adds up to a big, bigger pot, mm. right? So it's kind of better to get a little bit of a lot and then everybody eat, then we all come up and they follow that movement. Mm. So it immediately started being a friction because everything was about money and finance and being cheap, te mm. technically, you know what I'm saying? And just wanting everything for themselves. Instead of thing, knowing, like, yo, you feed the whole crew, everybody gonna come up, we gonna keep going. Mm. And when you take out, yo, Sha, I want this to myself, and then you get it to yourself, now you got a lot of a little, because now it's nothing. Because mm. no other album came out after I left except for the one Banks did, and I was in the basement with Banks encouraging him that he could do it and keep coming. We did Beamer, Benz, and Bentley, mm. shot the video, everything, and got it together, and then 50 came in, and then, all right, I'm behind it, right? But that kind of stuff you don't see because it's sweat equity that you don't count because mm. it's things that people do behind your back that's actually promoting things to move forward that you don't hold value to. 
You know what I'm saying? Because it's always about I'm the boss, I'm the man, I'm the rich one, I'm the, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So that kind of thing got in the way and you couldn't see the value for the little things that was around you that actually moved the pieces that actually made them move. Right, like Buck was uh, on a Vlad interview recently where he said that a big part of the issue with him was that he would go out in public, he's got people that want to be cool with him, he wants to be cool with them, he doesn't feel like he has any reason to be hating on some other rapper that he was probably in his room listening to a couple years ago, and 50 was just like really not okay with that idea, and you know, I've run into that as as a, I feel like almost anybody, if you're running a business, you're going to run into that, where you're going to have people you're cool with, that you work with, that are at least on friendly terms with people that really do not support what you're doing and mm-hmm. that you there can be tempted to really be like i don't want you conversating with this person i don't want you to have nothing to do with them but there's a certain level where when you're the boss you have to sort of let the people around you have some degree of freedom you can't expect everybody to really like fall in line in that way right yeah no nah, because you don't own them you gotta mm-hmm. let them be them right and I, that was an issue i felt like che guerrero next to fidel like we was on our own <laughs> island seriously i couldn't deal with anyone and half the time i produced for someone is because we entered to i worked with snoop through pimping and then mm-hmm. i got a track or two on his album certain things juvenile but it was always because i had to deal with people that he wouldn't trip out because he he had it he had beef with a lot of people you know what i'm saying yeah so we had to be careful with that because it would irritate them in a space where it just created a bad energy and then we couldn't move forward you know what i mean and like the modern template for how you are a successful rapper is that you basically like work with a lot of people work with outside people you get features from artists that are bigger than you etc and 50 at a certain point he was like oh i don't want to i don't want to put random ass girls and help them out singing on my records i'm gonna get my own woman and have her sing all the hooks so it can be all g-unit all, internal all g-unit, so he profit off of everything and that probably i don't think that that i think it insulates you too much you can't just be this island you yeah. have to be able to mix and mingle that's with the I'm rest saying. of the you artists gotta give right? out to you so it could come back it's all about that were you around for the magic stick drama and why there was never a video for that and shit Yo, i did the track shout out to phantom as well wow. so ridiculous we, yeah beat. that's so we crazy did that okay. in my basement gave it was actually for Trina first. Right. And then he was like, something happened where we connected with little Kim G. Robeson reached out to me. Shout out to G. And then I said, yeah, I got this record. 50 uh-huh. got a record. And then we sent it to him. So it was literally, that record was planted through a r someone reaching out, and then we had no ties to her. Okay. So when she had a team, there was a team that was a little bit more aggressive at the time than what 50 is used to dealing with on a business side. So certain things just started to clash. Mm. You know what I mean? It was an aggressive manager and aggressive people on the other side just trying to get things that he wasn't with. At that time, he was the top dude coming. So you had to work at his pace and on his schedule. And then he just decided, yo, I don't want to shoot a video for this. Let's just let the record be out. Mm. And he made that call and we ran with it. So it wasn't necessarily that he had any animosity towards the artist. No, definitely nothing with Mm. Kim. There was love. It was always love there. But she had a team that was just handling business a certain way that at the time it just wasn't. It wasn't good for us. Interesting. Yeah. That song could have been a lot bigger, huh? Nah, a whole lot bigger. Mm. And it made it to films and all that. You know, I'm seeing good royalties, but it's still like it could have been bigger. Mm. It could have been bigger. So you still get royalties on all those songs you were involved with back in the day, huh? Every one, man. I'm like a royalty collection firm, man. I ain't playing, bro. (laughs) I know how a lot of people ain't getting their money, so I make sure, you know. And even if it didn't recoup, I still want to see the statement. So Mm. I know at least it's going to be somewhere in the next five years, and then it'll recoup. So you comb through that shit every month. Every you, time, you, man. You, every time it come, Yo, comes I in. I open up a company just to collect for the hip-hop, because there's so many people that's not. Mm. I'll be sitting in rooms and talking to certain producers. I'm like, Yo, you didn't get your money off of that that we did back? I'm like, nah. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, bro? You better could get your money. Right. So you got to know how to go get it, too, you know? Definitely. Yeah, so it takes a lot. That makes sense, yeah. Especially, like, could you tell us, like, how much you made in, like, 2020 from, like, a particular song, ballpark <laughs> area? Like, like is that... Because I imagine, like, it's got to be kind of like you're, like, just, like... It's like you hit the lottery, like, 20 years ago, but then you keep getting, like, the payments ever so often. I could tell you this, that off my royalties alone, I don't have to work. Mm. So I could literally live off of that, but I choose to keep going and do other things to make more money on top of that. But that that's what kind of fucking amazes me sometimes when I'm talking to people who are already like completely solidified and they don't have to work but then they still choose to really grind and really like put themselves on the line on a regular basis like where where do you think that that comes from for, I love you? making music that's my mm. favorite part I hate the business I hate a lot of this exec shit and some of the like shit that go with the business but I love making music and, and working with new talent mm. that's dope making music that I know is gonna move the world once they actually get a grip of it so I love the music aspect, like really being in the studio making music. Right. 
but at some point the the beats became less important or you've you've started to feel more okay with being like the maestro and not the guy literally yeah, getting in there when i got with chains i knew i couldn't do some of those beats that he was looking for mm. so i knew you had to go find the next guys and and, and other dudes and he had guys in atlanta he was picking beats from so you just got to know your space and then mm. there's certain times certain artists that do fit you you know mm. like when mac miller called me and we did 100 grandkids mm. that actually worked you know, like right. he was looking for a sound that i actually get with right and i could do so we matched together and made that record that i thought was a dope record and rest in peace to mac miller rest you know what i'm saying so like certain things like that i know i gotta step away and that's not for me and then i get it from other people and that's where everybody get to eat and that's why reciprocity keeps coming back to me you were with two chains pre duffel bag boy or after as he no i knew him Buck introduced us. He was actually my weed dude. Like every time I go to Who Atlanta, was? yeah, bro. Wow. Every time I go to Atlanta, that's who I call for weed. So I knew him from that space. Like I didn't even like the rap thing came after when I saw him pull up one time in a Porsche. You love seeing the drug dealer win. Yeah, shit. I love that <laughs> shit, yo. This shit is the streets, yo. You this love seeing that truth, full yo. transition. Yeah, you know? so yeah. I'm seeing him like, yo, this yo, what the fuck? You got a Porsche? Like, I ain't even got a Porsche. This nigga here driving a Porsche. Right. So I seen him hustling in the hustle mode, and I seen him with the bag and, like, living up to, even after the rap shit quieted down, he still had everything looking like he was going. Mm. So I was like, yeah, that's right. He's a winner. And then he passed me the tape that had the, um, the record on it that ended up starting the buzz for him. Mm -hmm. um, the riding record, right? And um, after that, I went back up state to New York and went, just like, yo, this tape is fire. Mm. And then I had, you know, talked to the internal team, like, yo, we should sign 2 chains. I think he's not really signed to this deal no more. And, you know, he still got some, some politics we got to work out and let's try to work it out with him and for him. And, and we did it. Yeah. And we got the deal done. He brought in something that was totally different at that time, which was, in, in my opinion, it was very much like a sense of humor where he was aware of the absurdity of some of the things that he was saying mm -hmm. in a way where like prior to him, I felt like rappers very rarely represented the fact that they kind of knew that some of their most ridiculous boasts are ridiculous. Yeah. And he, he like he knew it and he was like playing with those things in a way that I hadn't seen anybody do before. Nah, and that was. was a that was a big change. That was a big change. And he knew how to to, to hit every pocket. Like if you looking for a lyricist, you'll be able to know that change is a lyricist. Mm. If you're looking for that funny like what the hell he just said, like you just talking about like some different shit to get your attention, that's change. So he know how to appeal to the audience just by what he used with the pen. I remember him getting some reviews at that time when his first project came out that were like the 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 most I've ever felt in my life of like holy fuck you do not get it mm -hmm. because they're treating it like oh like he's he's doing these stupid boasts these stupid like jokes they're they're just lame I'm mm -hmm. like they're not lame they're, they're funny. so funny and <laughs> over the top that's right in a way that I've never really seen nah, a rapper do before he's super witty and right. if you speak to him you can tell like this guy is a class act man and you still work with him no I still cool with him right. I ain't work with him because I left Def Jam and I, you know I, right. I ain't been producing for them but we still 100 you had any heartbreak over the years having a boom between labels and, and all of a sudden you're not involved with a rapper that you really had love for? Yeah, I think that was um, at that moment when I did leave Def Jam because mm -hmm. I was excited with what Crit was doing, what we were building. So Big Crit, like literally I found him before he put out that first mixtape and that was like really a discovery for me. So I was excited about that. And then 2 Chains, when that started going, he was taking off. Mm -hmm. So L.A. Reid went to Epic. And, you know, he saw me actually doing what he brought me there to do. Like, mm -hmm. I was turning it up over there. Like, they were saying Def Jam back, hashtag. Like, that went away when 2 Chains came because mm -hmm. he brought it back. So the energy was coming back, and now here he's bringing up some shit. And um, when I left, it was like, all right, L.A. elevated me, which is what we want to do in this corporate lab to keep climbing. But at the same time, I was winning there. And I had to leave two of my two winners. Mm. So that was the most hard part for me to have to do in my career, truthfully. Definitely. Yeah. How do you empower black executives to rise to the top of these record companies when so many of the people in like the biggest positions of power, are, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of them are extremely talented, but they're not necessarily of the culture in the way that somebody like you is like, how important is that to you? And what are, what are the things that need to be encouraged to, to help people realize their capacity in that regard? It's real important to me. I mean, for me, I see, you know, since the Black Mob Matter and all that stuff started, it was coalitions created in the industry. I'm not sure what they're doing. You hear about that, you but then you, the follow-ups you hear a little yeah, less, it's right? it's just like Black Lives Matter. You give them a big check, they shut up, and they're not really for the cause, right? Mm. They just, you know, getting shut up. So 
So for me, I'm just looking at it like, all right, there's a count, and it's like you want to balance the count between the executives that's in the business actually helping these artists groom them, such as me and other guys that's out here that's actually playing it from the outside, right? And then you look at the new generation, and you know, and like, all right, they paying them less to keep them in the building just for face value, but they're not actually going to elevate the business. Mm. So it's, it's a disbalance, right? But those guys are going to eventually get it, but it's just not in this time. And the guys that actually could get it and actually be chairmen, L.A. Reid was the last black chairman that I knew of the music business. Mm. The only other chairmen that are black are the ones that own their own labels, mm. but they're not chairmen for other corporations, right? right? So here L.A. Reid is gone, and he was the one I looked up to because he got me into Def Jam and then into Epic. So I always respect him because he's not only helped a lot of brothers, he made and took pride in that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So you don't have an executive or someone that's in a power, a position, to know that you got to carry on that type of thing to make sure that you're actually employing, finding other minorities, whether they're black or Spanish, and helping them come up. Mm. And so the guys that are in position are just happy to be there. They're not actually moving the fucking needle. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that's the disconnect that's happening right now in this industry. And then the chairman's got to actually, I've seen, I'm really happy to see what happened with Dallas, Dallas mm. um, that uh, just at Atlantic. They gave him a label and they gave him a president chair and like, here, you run this. Oh, that's, so that's what I like to see. And that should be more of that, you know? Right. Shout out to Tubby, the same thing. He's about to do his thing. So it's certain execs that are getting in that position now, it's them. They got to do what they know we got to do. We got to help bring more brothers in and help them grow into this business. But it's kind of weird, too, because isn't part of that like having to basically explain to somebody how to be more corporate, how to lessen well, your of, personality no, so that you can fit in in this well, environment? Truthfully, a lot tricky. of us, there's no educational requirements in this business, right? Mm. So nobody is coming in knowing like you got to do this or this is what you got to you got to take responsibility in hip hop is the most less I don't want to take responsibility mm. industry in the game, right? Right. So the executives that are in it have to take responsibility. Mm. And they have to, like, I've been in programs that Sony took me to called Fast Forward, where it actually advanced your mind as, as an executive. So you understand, you're not just here to sign talent, you know how to deal with numbers, you know how to deal with the communication and how to deal with the company. Mm. And find that you can rise in the market share by being an executive. But not everybody get that opportunity. And it's mm. not even when I went to fast forward, I had to fly to London and do it. I was the only brother there. Right. So it's like those little opportunities you don't get and it's not out available to everybody. Mm. So you got to be able to help those people when you do get those opportunities. Definitely. Um, do you feel like you like were you, were you ever like do you feel like you are fully capable of existing in that kind of corporate environment? Because I feel like when I look at somebody like, you know, the guys from QC or something, you could imagine that they could have probably like got label jobs given how good they apparently seem to be at their job and risen up in that granted they're from a very different background and shit, but why would they want to? It mm -hmm. makes more sense for them to just do their own thing where they get to just be themselves and have their own culture and everything instead of having to necessarily go fit in at a label. They build their own thing and then let the label come and make that's, them happy. That's right? their dynamic which works for them, which is great. Mm -hmm. But then there's certain people like me, like I've been spending a lot of time hiring people for monthly retainment that actually say they could do the job and can't do it. I right. don't want to go through that. You want to be in a corporation where everyone is getting actually fired if they ain't doing their job and you be able to be accountable as a boss to make sure that they, when this marketing plan come together, product managers doing this, digital's doing that, promos doing that, A&R's doing that, and have that team internally. Instead of trying to find kids you gotta hire and eventually figure it out, right. I'd rather be in a structure where you know that everybody's doing their job, and if they not, you could call them out, fix the problem, and, and go to the solution mode. For sure. How, how depressing do you find it that you have to be concerned about like you, your artist songs getting on TikTok? <laughs> Actually, they blowing up. TikTok blowing songs up. So, yeah. I mean, if they get there, I mean, it's, it's a good look. But you've been in the game for a long time. It's, it's got to feel kind of ridiculous. It is ridiculous. <laughs> it is, man. It is ridiculous. But I'm like, yo, I'm, I'm liking a few songs myself. So it's like, all right, it's the repetitiveness that, that creates that energy that they just get into it. Mm. So it's like they that's the new marketing. Hey, we got we to gotta kind of get into that too, you know? But I'm always getting emails from labels and shit trying to be like, oh, we want you to interview this artist. And it's they have the number one TikTok song of the month. And yeah, I go to look. Corny, yeah. They got no fucking followers. Nobody gives a fuck, fuck who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's corny. That's right got to be one of the biggest problems for artists now is that you can have a huge song and still not be famous or successful at all. Yeah. You just have a huge TikTok sound. It's true. And I don't look for those. I look for mm. the real talent, you know? So I'm never looking at your streams and your numbers. I never signed you over that. I signed you over that. This is going to be a movie. Like, I could see this, the real story. Definitely. And that's what I look for. Bobby and Roddy get out. 
how do you think about what they should be doing right now? And, you know, because it's like you, there's, there's a big risk of overexposure, mm -hmm. you know? They could put out, you know, two mixtapes in the first two weeks they're out, and it's almost like you've then given up all of the goodwill that built up while you were gone for that long if you overdo it with the music and stuff. Like, what's your advice to them, or what's, what's the game plan? Yo, I was so happy to see them come home, man. I mean, I was thrilled. And I know that they, they put in a lot of time. And Bobby, his dedication to Rowdy and serving the extra time, I shot him out for that. Mm. So for me to see that, I'm just excited to see him home. The pressure, you know, you got to let them kind of actually get into the studio to make some songs before it's all about pressure and coming straight to the world. And mm. let make sure you pick the right record, you know. Right. So I'm happy he didn't come out with a record already because that means he's taking time, figuring out who's the right studio engineer to work with that's going to record him like how we set that up or who's the right producer that's going to be giving him them beats that he need that's right for right now. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because it's a different time. So now... You might have a lot of energy on your first day out, but I always think like an artist would be way better off making a couple dozen songs or something that's before right. you... Choose you from a dozen. Pick yeah. the one. You Not know? just from two or three. And I mean, even that short period of time, I had to get a lot of records to get that, that Shmurda She Wrote EP out of him. Mm. And that was, that was the little six months that we had to do that. And it's like Bobby take his time in the studio, so you got to give him that time to do that. Mm. And you can't rush him. So I'm watching the label and everybody like, all right, I'm going to see what they do with this. I hope they do them right, man. And that's mm. all I want, man, to him to just go and do his thing. Were you, he uh, deserve it. Were you involved with the Bobby 6 9 collab that I, I, I assume is probably not looked upon so <laughs> so happily these days? Right? I, I, even, I forgot about Cause that. Because he's in prison. He's like, how the fuck did that end up happening? Yeah, somebody had a vocal, man. The drives was out. Somebody oh, gave it. Oh, it was like that. It wasn't the homies probably. No, but gave. it was a jail verse, right? Oh, it was? I think so, yeah. Were? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. See, I ha I have a drive. I never leaked nothing. I, I got songs. You I know think it mean? got deleted though. I think it uh it got deleted off YouTube at well, some point. That's good for six nine because he knew how to stood, stand next to everything real right. to get that energy to use him to well, keep him going. Before he got his Fed case, what was your perspective on him as a New Yorker who presumably cares about how a random Brooklyn rapper is doing and stuff like? What did you think of the energy that he was bringing before the whole snitching and the Fed case and everything? Yeah, I couldn't believe it because I, I just didn't look real to me. Mm. It never looked real to me. It always looked crazy, and I just didn't understand how he was able to do that. But when I watched the documentary, seeing how he was able to use them, and they were just, they didn't ever understand what they were going through. That's mm. that's an eye opener to everybody. Right. You get a, you better be waking up right now because the motherfuckers is out here vultures. Yeah. And that's a vulture right there. Mm. And he was able to. To get through and actually commit could complete the job yeah he did it's true yep. um you think his career will ever really recover or you think it's kind of nah, it's done because the the shit he did you just can't you can't you got to go out like a champ man and he didn't it still blows my mind every time i see one of his posts pop up on instagram and i look at it and it's got seven million views and i go to look at the comments and it's no rappers no people in the rap industry nothing in the comments mm -hmm. It's very strange. Nah, he just exists because the opportunity is for everybody now. YouTube, mm. you can, anybody can be in. Before hip-hop, you had to get through, you know, native tongue. You had to get through different different tribes to get you through the industry, you mm. know. And now it's just put it up, you right. know. And he's just a part of that now. Definitely. Um, Bobby and them really kind of like started uh, – in a lot of ways, kind of started like the whole Brooklyn drill wave that has kind of like been slowly building up That's over like the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that energy? How likely is is that sort of energy? Because we see that drill thing popping up in all kinds of cities all over the world, in England, and I've seen videos of drill rappers in Ireland and all kinds of crazy shit. Like It's almost like that is a template that people are very comfortable with of listening to guys rap over a specific type of production about basically who they're beefing with but how 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 do you view that and how likely do you think it is to turn into like a real music career for some of these guys it's, it's starting to turn i mean rest in peace pop smoke he mm. took it to a new level this man. is true and when i listen to his records now I'm, i literally feel sad that he's dead because i love his music you know mm. what i'm saying and i feel like the, there's other guys fabio that can actually advance just like he did it's not only the drill rap that they need to do they can find some other beats mm. that's going to cater to the other audience like pop did mm. and that's what you got to slowly do you get in certain ways and then you kind of expand it you know once you got their attention i think for bobby and for me 
It was about finding the artists in New York and bringing back the energy New York was missing. Because mm. from having that energy with G-Unit and knowing what the real to be on top in New York felt like, I was missing that feeling. So I was mm. like trying, I'm with, I'm with Yo Gotti, he's like, he's from the South, but it doesn't feel the same when you're in New York, because he's not a New York rapper. So I'm looking for the next one. I'm thinking it was Troy Ave, I'm thinking it's this guy, and it's like, nah, there's none of them. And then when that Bobby came, I felt like he was that one, and he was, and he opened up that gate, and then everybody came in after, and then he had to do his time. Mm. So now it's time for him to take the crown, put it on, and do his thing. That must have been rough for you to like, you know, because you, you work with artists, and the fact that you you saw that high with G Unit, that and you know, years and years of just it being one of the biggest things in the game, and then you know, you, you're always wondering in your head like if you're gonna feel that again and then with the bobby thing you had that but then realistically it was only a couple of months before it kind of got yeah, shut down nah, huh? that, that shit fucked me up because for two reasons and i want to say this so clearly because the industry screwed me on this one right so here i am always finding talent you bring me in this find the illest talent so y'all can make money this mm. guy you see 10 what five million on this single three million on the other one gold on this on the ep mm -hmm. He did his, and he's gonna do more, right? And this is what we're here to bring, right? So with 50, as soon as we did that first number, Jimmy's like, hey, we're gonna give you your labels. Hey, y'all start your label and do the G-Unit stuff. Mm. You get rewarded for the success, right? So here we are, I'm thinking this is about to happen, and then that happens, right? Not only does he go to jail, I get fired. Mm. You got fired? I got fired. For, wait, what, what was the reasoning? That's what I'm saying, right? There wasn't, they just, like, this is too much right now. We're going to have to just change things up a bit. Now, I'm sitting here trying to fight for the next kid on the roster that was still signed to GS9. His name was Abilion. I'm still trying to get things in motion because Rowdy had a record with Too Short that I just did that was a smash and had Bobby on it. So I'm, I'm talking to the label, trying to get it going, and they're like, shh, this guy's talking too much. He needs to shut him up. So it was about silencing Wow. and putting the fire out, and I was a part of putting the fire out. Wow. Because when I walk, I, I represent an artist. If I'm telling you to sign somewhere, I'm going to tell you I'm going to do my job. I'm going to commit to doing it. So I still was trying to get them going even while they was in jail. Right. And it was all about, shh, stop that. And oh, so when you say that you... I was pushing the wrong agenda. But you said you haven't worked with a label since then. No. Nah. That's why. Hey. Because they want the danger and the allure and the yeah. street shit up until it becomes until, a little too real. It's right there in your living room. But how the fuck are they going to judge you for just bringing in the Bro, shit that they wanted you to that's bring what I'm in? Saying, but that's the industry, right? And that's <sighs> what they know how to take and give you what you want and you get shit out of it. So, But that's got to be the ultimate disrespect that just made you like, I can't, I can't work with these people yeah, like that anymore. It's a fucked up game. Wow. You know I mean, the world needs to just know that though, but you just got to play the game differently, you know? That's crazy. Yeah. Who's the artist that you really like almost had but you didn't get it and it really kind of hurts a little bit deep down everybody know i'm gonna say j cole man oh okay i didn't yeah. know that yeah shout out to mike rooney my he brought he's from my hood him and his uh his uh, uncle Corey rooney was 50 was working with uh -huh. you know back in the days i knew them so he was able to come to 50 crib and all of that because he was family and one day he came up to connecticut we in the basement, and he brings some kid. He's like, yo, it's J. Cole. Uh -huh. and he played a record. Y'all was going crazy, man. So you knew. I knew it. Wow, okay. And that became the first mixtape that dropped that he blew up off of. But I knew it. So I was waiting for It was late at night, so I waited for 50 the next day to holler at him. And he didn't see it. And I had to go to him. It was his, you know, G-Unit, let's sign this. Like, this is what we need to do. Right. And that's not the direction he wanted to take. Wow. So What, what do you think that he didn't get about it? He just... I mean, it is like a polar opposite side of rap. At the time, I think he didn't understand the wave and then everything was gangster rap, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So it wasn't no street shit, so he didn't understand that this was a wave coming. I knew it. I seen it and I heard it. And I was like, this kid is going to take it. And right. he just didn't hear it. He didn't see it. That would be such a fascinating part of J. Cole's career if he had like a little G-Unit stint. No, the funniest part is 50 ended up on one of his albums after. Oh, did he? Really? Yeah, Fuck. he did like a hook. So when I seen that, I was like, look at that shit, bro. Ain't that something, bro? <laughs> it's like, motherfucker, bro. Just listen to me, bro. Because all yeah. my win, I brought Young Buck to the unit. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I brought them certain people to the unit that brought energy and brought a balance. Even when Game was in the studio in L.A., like, mm. with Dre. I was the one that Mike, Mike Flint brought him to me. And I was the one that brought him to the unit. Mm. So I'm always in between the artists coming up and knowing how to be able to be that smooth communicator to bring it together. And that's how that, that West Coast, G-Unit West, G-Unit South... And the growth of the gene. You know Spider, shout out to Spider Look. Yeah, shout out to Spider Look. That's what 50, 50 brought him in. You know what I mean? But I was looking, you know, I bought Buck, and that shit was like right, you know, right timing. 
history has made out the 50 versus Kanye album sales battle to basically be like a deciding factor in hip hop's fate. Did it feel like that at the time or is that just kind of how people choose to view it now? They choose to view it now. At the time, you know, I was like, yo, Kanye fucking coming. I was at the Grammys. He was right there. I'm like, oh, this motherfucker coming. Right. Because he went from looking at him just as a producer mm. to, yo, right now he's standing right next to Fifth. He ain't talking no gangster shit or nothing. Mm. So, but his energy, and he was around a lot of places that I would, like, if I'm leaving Dre's studio, I see Kanye coming in. So I seen this growth of someone at the time. So when he got to that point where he was standing toe to toe to Fifth, I couldn't believe it, bro. Mm. And it was because you watched the growth of him grow so fast without that kind of story. And it's like the car accident happened and then all the other shit just... Pff, 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 and then he was just right there toe to toe. Right. And he was bringing it. He was bringing it. He did bring it, though. And he came up at a speed yeah. that was a lot faster than what the mm -hmm. speed was that 50 came up just because technology had changed and everything. And mm -hmm. You think 50 was like really fundamentally not ready for the fact that the world was going to view somebody like Kanye, who was not a gangster, on the same level as him? That's the same story with J. Cole, because he didn't think that, mm. that 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 type of hip-hop would actually come right and just keep going, mm. you know? And that's what he did. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, Kanye kept going. It's kind of a classic story of being like so entrenched in what you're doing that you can't see what's what's coming. What's coming, nah. Mm -hmm. And that's but me as a music lover, me that been buying hip hop since the beginning, seeing the evolution, I'm knowing what's next. You know, you know it's gonna be some conscious that need to come in. You know it's too much gangster shit going on. You mm -hmm. know you need some some fun shit going on. So you know the ever it's the evolution of hip hop. But do you feel like it's different now because it's kinda like all the sides of hip hop of hip hop are allowed to coexist where you have all this like fruity bum bubblegum shit and then you have like the most gangster shit and it kinda all can exist at the same time because hip hop like fan base wise is so fractured now. It's not like when it was the radio and the like when fifties like on M T V all day, that's M T V saying this is what hip hop is. It is and, and programming. There's you. not like an ability for you to believe it's that many other things when MTV's how 90% of people who watch TV are taking in music. That's true. And yeah. hip hop can't be programmed as we used to program it. There's only MTV or BT jams or MTV music or yo MTV raps. Right. You can't be programmed like that. So actually, it's better now because you got a preference. If that's not what you want, you can just keep finding those discoveries that lead you to more artists that's in that pocket. Mm. And it's good. You know, because not everybody, everything is for everyone. But Sean Money XL stays in the streets. I'm in the streets, man. I'm outside. We here. We ain't afraid. We loving it. Do you think that you were the guy to guide J. Cole's career to where it's at now? Or was that not necessarily in your wheelhouse? No, I wish. I wish. No, actually, I was. I would go back, play the tape every day, put the homies on. I seen it. Like, mm. I knew it. And then I heard the story of how Mark Pitts heard him and then, and when Jay-Z heard him the same day, Jay-Z signed him the same day, like there was no, let me go home and let's think about it. Like he actually did a deal. So the, the fact that Jay-Z felt that same feeling that I was feeling, I didn't have the power to do it at that moment. That's when mm. I started saying, all right, that was the beginning of my end at G-Unit as well. Mm. Cause that's, that's something that would have elevated G-Unit to this time right now. So then I went on to Def Jam and did it for them and, and kept going, you know what I mean? But that could have all been in one house. Yeah. You know? Definitely. It's been a pretty wild career you had. Yeah, man. And we, ba we barely said anything about Mob Deep. I know. Rest in peace, Prodigy, man. Rest in peace, Prodigy. One of the first rappers to ever come in my crib. Like, when I'm in the basement, see me fucked up, broke, trying to get beat sold. And, mm. and he was dead. Rest so, in peace. Yeah, rest in peace to P. Are there any Shout rappers to that Abby. come to mind that you do not have any business involvement with that you listen to out of your own free will at this point? Like, what with some stuff that has uh, stood out to you? Oh, uh, man, it's... For one, Kendrick Lamar, mm -hmm. my top, top, top five. Um, and then there's a lot of new artists that I'm vibing to. You know, Benny the Butcher and the Hope mm -hmm. Zelda and BSF. Shout out Benny, yep. Yeah, they killing it. You know, I love that. Um, still Crit, I'm still Crit, and there's a few other things coming coming from from the South that I'm digging. Definitely. You know, new artists like uh, Chubbs the Dreamer. Okay, um, I gotta check him out. Yeah, my boy Jovian that's in the building. Okay. You know, it's a new generation of dope music that I'm that I'm seeing and I'm about to like let y'all hear it. It's coming, man. And uh got some coming out of Ohio. This kid named Sandy Benjamin. Okay. And shout out to my boy Teddy Andreas. So we got a, a few dope dope artists that shout uh, Teddy. Yeah. And he's not, not out a here. name I expected nah, you to say that. Yeah, I know, but they out here. They out here. And Teddy, I'm pretty sure you crossed paths with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely, so yeah. yeah. So yeah. So you know? Crazy. Yeah, man. It's inspiring, man. Uh much respect. You 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 saw the vision, I think, of uh, what the game was to become 
quite a bit in advance and you're, you're, you're in the position you're in because of that. And it's very inspiring. Thank you, bro. And I thank you for having me on this platform to, to be able to get the story out. And let them know, nobody jerked me, man. Everything you learn <laughs> in life is about wins and lessons, not losses. None of that. Even if you learn from it, it's a lesson. You know what I'm saying? That's a Not fact. a loss, man. Mm, that's real. Shout out Shaman XL. Yo. No Jumper. Coolest podcast no jumper. in the world. Check, out us out, uh, check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. Like, comment, subscribe at nojumper.com if you want to support. Appreciate you, man. That's right. Thanks, bro. Love.